<clears throat> okay, everybody, I think we can get started. I want to uh, welcome you and uh, to our last, the last session of, uh, of uh, this, uh, the critical theory, June session. And to those of you who have spent three long, exhilarating and exhausting weeks, especially, I want to thank you for coming up, finding the energy to come up here for your, this session. Uh, <clears throat> as some of you may know, my major field is working with literary texts and with language. But like everyone else, I think, my life is very influenced by uh, visual images of all sorts. So there's a kind of a disjunct between what I work on and uh, what I, uh, uh, and a great part of my lived experience. And uh, uh, so, so I've been, had occasion throughout to think about uh, how these two elements, text and image and visuality, actually interact and relate with each other. And what I'm going to present tonight is, are some first thoughts on this subject. So uh, keeping in mind that I'm not an expert on things visual, I'll be just trying to uh, begin to analyze some of my experiences with a phenomenon that is a, a, turns out to be, at least in my experience, quite a bit more complicated than, than, than one might think or I might have thought. So if you don't mind, I'll start with an autobiographic uh, note. Um, I was born and raised in New York City at a time when television had not yet appeared on the everyday scene, that is, in the 40s and 50s. In some respects, as you might imagine, I don't care to think too much about that time since it dates me a bit more than I would like. But I'm also grateful to have experienced it. And only with the years have I come to realize what an important time it actually was for me. I call it, in my mind, the time before TV. I'm also, I have to add, I'm also an inveterate TV viewer. Uh, although not an unconflicted one, as you can also imagine. So I call this growing up period the time before TV, although that is really a far too negative description for what it was like growing up in New York City during and above all after the Second World War. It was an exciting time for many reasons, but one of them I only came to appreciate many years later when it no longer existed, at least not in the same way. <clears throat> for what I'm calling the time before television was a time that still left room for another quite different medium, which played a central role in my childhood, namely the medium of radio. In short, my childhood was spent during those radio days that Woody Allen has immortalized in his film, and like his film, I experienced them at home with my family, in particular with my younger sister. But for me, they were not so much radio days as radio nights, since they tended to begin after sundown and to last long into the night. They brought me my first experience of what at the time were called serials, and where I discovered for the first time the relationship between narrative, repetition, a certain recursivity, usually in the form of recurring figures such as the Lone Ranger and his faithful sidekick, Tonto. These were not quite the same as the soap operas that were usually broadcast in the afternoons and which dealt with familiar problems of everyday life, marriage, love, heartache, etc. These seemed to be directed toward a primarily feminine audience, women who stayed and worked at home, housewives, as they were then called, as though they were married to their houses rather than to their husbands, which may, after all, have been a more accurate description of their fate. Many had returned to their homes after 1945, uh, after a period, a brief period, when they had replaced husbands and sons and gone to war, working. And presumably, the letdown that resulted was in part compensated or perhaps rather distracted by these soaps that proliferated in those post-war years. But my interest was directed at those strange heroes who were anything but everyday or familiar, 
struggling against the forces of evil, and always, but always winning. Just as the myth that I grew up with was that the United States itself was one of those heroes, having just struggled victoriously against the forces of evil in Europe and in Asia, and above all, in its long history, having never lost a war. Many years later, I learned that this was also a historical myth of the Japanese, our adversaries in that war, which made the outcome of the Second World War for them all the more unbelievable and traumatic. The radio heroes that dominated my childhood were figures such as Superman, Batman, Robin, the Shadow, the Lone Ranger, the latter being described each time, as I've indicated, as the masked rider, always in the company of his faithful sidekick. But there was also a second type of radio program that was very important to me, although it was not at all a serial, because it was not organized around the adventures of a single recurrent hero, or even a group of heroes, uh, and also uh, broadcast less frequently. The serials were transmitted two or three times a week, but these other programs were usually weekly, if not bi-weekly, and their continuity was generic rather than personal. One such was called Dimension X, which adapted well-known science fiction stories of the period so they could be told within the space of 30 or 60 minutes. One of the most vivid dimensions from the, uh, one of the most vivid memories from this period, and as a confirmed Freudian, I tend to suspect such vividness as evidence of what Freud designates as screen memories, memories that are there precisely in order to assist forgetting rather than remembering. But anyway, one of the most vivid memories of this period um, This is very weird. I jumped around here. Um, involved, uh, involved a night scene, a scene of listening uh, to the radio in a pitch black bedroom where my sister and I are each on our separate beds and between us there's a small point of yellow light, the glimmer of a, uh, of a wood radio to which we were both glued, as it were, metaphorically, to be sure, listening to a dramatization of Robert Heinlein's The Green Hills of Earth. Now, this story recounts the space travel of one noisy Riesling, a songwriting engineer who had been blinded by radiation, a kind of American Odysseus dreaming of a return home, as the following refrain from probably his most famous song suggests, it's your first quote on the handout, uh, but you can just listen to it. We pray for one last landing on the globe that gave us birth. Let us rest our eyes on the fleecy skies and the cool green hills of earth. The episode I remember tells of a landing on a distant planet that turns out to resemble almost exactly the childhood world of the space travelers. It turns out to be something of a counterpart to the Sirens episode in the Odyssey, which may well have inspired it. These space travelers, in any case, revisit the figures of their childhood, except that these figures turn out to be evil aliens who intend to prevent those travelers from ever returning home to those cool green hills of Earth. What I remember most, however, and the reason I'm telling the story at all, is a small detail. The means by which these aliens betray themselves to their prospective victims is that despite their exact resemblance with friends and relatives of childhood, they give off a strange greenish hue. The only indication that anything might be wrong that this uncanny doubling of desire might be lethally different from what it seems to be, 